Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session on competing in digital ecosystems. I'm Michael Jacobides, a professor at the London Business School who focuses uh, both in terms of uh, theory and practice on some of these topics. And we've got a terrific panel to uh, help us understand um, what's going on uh, in this world. So first, starting with quick introductions, we've got Adam Cohen, who's the global policy director for Google. We've got Eva Kaili, who is a vice president of the Euro Parliament, and I should also say someone who particularly cares about technology and has been involved in the recent deliberations, including the currently debated Digital Markets Act that is the freshest thing that has come from the European Union on that. And we have Francois Condelon, who is uh, the global managing director of the thought leadership arm of BCG, the Henderson Institute, and a senior partner um, in uh, the firm as well. Let me give you a bit of context in terms of what we're speaking about and why ecosystems are a thing. And when we speak about ecosystems, we speak about a couple of different things bundled together. The first thing is that as a result, first, of changes in terms of regulation, you see, we used to compete in sectors well delineated, not only by tradition, but also by regulation. And the second, digitization, that allows us to make bundles and to offer services to customers in wholly new ways, we're seeing the landscape of competition being reshaped. Think about what's changing even in the devices that are starting to enter our homes. Right now, there is a fight, for instance, in terms of the smart hub perhaps around the smart fridge. Your fridge knows that your milk has run out. And one of the interesting battles is who's going to be ordering the milk and who's going to be making the margins from it. From your fridge, nowadays, you can control your smart uh, lighting, you can control your safety controls, you can control perhaps your Nest thermostat, speaking of one of uh, Google's uh, products. And what you see is that organizations are creating these bundles, these multi-product experience bundles you can see it everywhere, consumer group products that want to change the way that they compete. Big technology firms that are moving in anywhere from wellness uh, to how do I understand the world around me. In addition to these bundles, these ecosystems of different products uh, or experiences, we also have ecosystems in terms of many different firms that come together to produce a particular product. If you think about your phone, your phone is not the result of one company that gives it to you lock, stock, and barrel. Your phone, in terms of its apps, allows you to use an app store. By the app store are countless people, the complementers, who need to play by the rules that the orchestrator of the app ecosystem has in order to participate. And this is new. We used to have vertically integrated firms that would do everything, or we used to have firms with a supply chain. Now, with the possibility of having an ecosystem of complementers that are going to be agreed by the orchestrator, but giving choice to the customer, we have a new way of organizing. Now, this is fun and exciting, and it certainly has underpinned the growth of the big tech firms. We can see at the market capitalization uh, and the way that it has changed in terms um, of these large organizations, but it also changes how existing firms compete. We see ecosystems in some of the other buzzwords, and we'll try to have a crack at them in terms of, of the ecosystems around AI and whatever metaverse will be, uh, metaverse. And finally, ecosystems suggest that there is a new type of power, a power that comes from orchestrating these large ecosystems, and a power that is not necessarily described, defined, seen by, countered by the existing regulation, which is precisely why we have now seen significant regulatory action. And we'll try very quickly to go through that in two quick rounds of conversation. So Adam, starting with you, could you please help us understand how does a big tech firm like Google think about and structure these ecosystems? How do you build these ecosystems? Well, I think the starting point is how do you build good products that are going to serve people well? Uh, Google's had a motto, uh, I think it's 20 years old now, that if you focus on the user, the rest will follow. And that's really the mindset that we've approached building products. How do you create a search engine that better serves people? How do you integrate services like maps? How do you create a, a better mobile ecosystem that, that lowers prices and increases access? Uh, we, we've really thought about how do we focus on the consumer and then 
following that, what's the right kind of design to, to address those particular needs? Uh, my fridge, by the way, doesn't let me know when the milk is empty. I don't know if that's exactly what consumers are looking for. Uh, but if you see what, what the demand is, I think you have to find products that, that, meet, that meet consumers where they are. I think one of the ecosystems that might be worth talking about a little bit is Android, where there was some thinking on our part about how do you design an open source successful ecosystem that can expand access to smartphones. There are smartphones available around the world today for as little as $50. Um, they've dramatically increased access to the internet globally. Um, they've increased competition in the mobile ecosystem. And we actually had to think about how to design a successful and sustainable ecosystem there. Open source software is subject to fragmentation. Anybody can take the software and modify it however they like. And then, then some of those applications or complementers that you described, um, they tend to veer away from the platform if it doesn't have a certain degree of consistency. And there we think of ecosystem governance or, or uh, you know, how do you, how do you, you called it orchestration, but how do you create a platform that has certain basic standards so that different services can, can join it, can interoperate with it, and that ultimately it's going to create a viable ecosystem that serves that consumer. Right. Well, uh, Eva, let me turn to perhaps the um, challenges with that, because on the one hand, we hear that all of this is in the service of convenience. At the same time, what we know is that there is a concern from the people who are not in the strong, powerful position that an ecosystem orchestrator is that can call the shots. And I know that the European Union, uh, much as uh, many other key blocks, have been rethinking the rules that relate to power and the potential abuse of power in terms of the ecosystems. Could you give us a sense of what are the key objectives that you have when we think about this regulation on the European level? Well, actually, I know that when uh, people hear regulation, they want much uh, less of it. But uh, at the same time, we're trying to succeed uh, exactly what now it's been told. To have strong ecosystems, we have to ensure that the access to the market is open. So this is our um, initial priority. And why do we need uh, uh, legislation and regulation now, since internet is there for like decades now, and everything uh, we dreamed of, like services and products, they are already on our mobile device. So um, the last, I'd say, like 20, 30 years, our e-commerce uh, directives and regulation have, have not been updated. They were built on the offline um, uh, understanding of the world. So we needed to update because we, we had such like big players, awesome players like Google, but still so big that it was very difficult to keep the market open into innovation and into uh, competition. So regulation came with the DMA, I talk now, because we have several different pieces that they serve different um, uh, needs. Uh, in order to ensure that gonna, there's going to be a vibrant ecosystem and there's going to be a possibility of uh, new players entering. And this is what we try to achieve. And since um, after the pandemic, we are all a bit wiser and we understand the geopolitics of digitalization, we understand also the necessity of having players that um, they, uh, they, they manage to, have the they, to provide us and have the strategic autonomy necessary. Uh, to ensure that with like-minded partners we can continue and we will not have the disruptions that we could face or we, we felt that we might have faced um, during the pandemic and during now um, a war conflict. Um, so this is what we try to do and our main uh, goal, so when the goal is to serve the consumers and the users, our goal is to protect them, uh, not protectionism, so this is a thin line, so we need to ensure that we protect them. They feel that when they enter um, an application or a product, it is safe to use, so it's been checked by their government. This is the trust that we need to have and we do have in the European, for example, environment. You know that your government ensures that your data are being safe, they are being protected, that when a labeling comes and it tells you what the, pro the, the product is about, it's exactly as it says it is. So this is what we need to ensure also on the um, online world. So we need to translate what we were used to have offline, online. We delayed, but I think um, usually it's better to be late in innovation, to allow innovation to happen, and then to ensure that you will also um, allow the big ones to remain big because they have a different capacity of producing amazing services and products, but also to leave room for um, competition, not to have, for example, killer acquisitions that they, they, 
uh, take them or they have so much access to data because we didn't regulate fast. And now they're so big that they can um, control the environment and the market. And this means, for example, if somebody wants to enter, it's very difficult or there is no interoperability or it's not compatible, the product with the uh, ongoing marketplaces. Terrific. Uh, just to clarify, when we're speaking about the DMA, one of the interesting features is that the focus is not only on the final consumer, what you and I will experience, but also in the protection of these complementers, of the other firms that engage with yes. the ecosystem orchestrators, which is where it becomes a little bit more relevant to us. And I'd like to turn to that next, Francois, because uh, so far it might be, well, great, this is just an interesting discussion that relates to big tech, and perhaps we're going to try to curb part of the big tech what does that have to do with me? So let's now think about most of the people in this room who are not in big tech. And uh, many of them are in uh, companies trying to see what is the relevance for me. So let's go to the more traditional companies and let's take all these changes with the emerging or emergence of these uh, platforms and ecosystems. What does it mean for them? Why should they care? Why should they care? Because they cannot, they don't have the choice. So uh, because I think that we need to understand in terms of the level of uncertainty on one hand and uh, all the new things that they need to take into account for their offers, for their products. Sustainability, how to get the best of the tech and AI, all of that. Many companies, and I sure some of yours, they don't have a clue. So no idea about how to do that. And, and this is where they need to cooperate, they need to collaborate more. Let's take, for instance, AI. It's very difficult for traditional companies to uh, hire uh, data scientists. At the same time, they need these algos, but in return, they can provide data. So I think that more collaboration between companies dedicated to AI with traditional companies into an ecosystem is much better. So more collaboration. Then we said, and uh, if I refer to uh, Ronald Coase's um, article on the nature of the firm, of course, the new technologies, as we all know, reduced, reduced the, um, the, uh, the, the transaction cost. And therefore, there is as well more modularity. So when you have collaboration and modularity, this is a moment when your industry is really driven and the competitive advantage comes from an ecosystem versus a vertically integrated firm versus an hyper, uh, let's say, um, a hierarchical supply chain. So I think that what we see is that at the moment in many industries, the game is changing. And, and I would like everyone to remember um, the, 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 what Stephen Islope uh, said when, uh, Ilope, sorry, said when he was the CEO of uh, Nokia uh, about the collapse of its company. He was saying, if I remember well, the, the, the game has changed from the battle of devices to the war of ecosystems. Absolutely. And basically, that means that we need to think about our companies that now have a new mandate because they need to think about how they can either think about the ecosystems around them as access distribution, they can think about them as they can recombine and rethink what the boundaries of their own organizations are and change the packages that they offer. Yes. Now, let me go to the changing boundaries of these firms and let me go to Google. Google has expanded and um, has had to convince regulators, for instance, that your position of Fitbit was fit and proper and you moving into tracking health data um, was not going to create issues. And if you look at what Big Take has done, it has expanded the boundaries of what it did. Perhaps the battle for the fridge is not a central one yet, but you know, Samsung and Hire uh, want to work and there's a question whether they're going to be working with both Google and Amazon or one of the two. But before that becomes mainstream, let me go to the way that Google is thinking about expanding its footprint, about thinking about how broad it, it'll become. It has already extended the boundaries of the areas that it offers. Where do we see that go? How do you think that the big technology firms, such as yours, not only Google, are changing their boundaries and thinking about how far their ecosystems are going to cover? It's an interesting question, Mike, because it sort of suggests that there are certain lanes in our economy that, you know, Google is a search engine and uh, Microsoft provides an operating system and Apple builds hardware and this is sort of how things should persist. But what we see in tech and I'd say across the wider economy is that those lines in an effective and dynamic economy are constantly being blurred. 
And when I think about Google's own role in this, I mean, we don't sort of look across the landscape and go, where, you know, where do we go next? We really think about the user interest and how can we better serve our customers. So I'll give you an example of this where we made a very early, very big investment that you know, probably benefits most of the people in this room, which is Maps. So we were a search engine. People would come to Google. They would search for an address. And in the early days, the best we could do was show you a website that might have mentioned in the text the address, you know, the place that you were looking for. And we realized very early on that the best thing we could do to answer your question was not to provide you a link to a website, but to show you a pinpoint on a map. And that, believe it or not, it's so commonplace now, but that technology did not exist at the time. And so we invested in, in mapping technology. We actually drove streets around the world to ensure that our maps were the most accurate. And we continue to invest billions in, in the mapping space to better serve the customer. Now, an online mapping business at the time might have said, well, this is my area, and I'm a complementer, and I should, why should Google be able to do this? And it's a, it's a difficult question, because what you want in dynamic competition is firms to rub up against each other. You don't want them to think about, well, this is my lane. I'm a refrigerator business. I'm not in the data business. Absolutely. Uh, basically, that tells us that not only do you want to think about cutting across different sectors, you don't even think of the sectors. The customer centricity, which is part and parcel of what we're seeing that is brought about by tech, an important distinction that it isn't just about technology. It's about some service orientation, and then you do stuff, and if the historian of the future says, oh, you entered a different sector, the answer is, so be it, we well, did. I, look, I'm not a business school pr professor, but I, I, there are few businesses that succeed that don't focus on their customers. Indeed, and now you have to think about just how far you will be able to um, focus on the customer. So, um, Eva, there's a part of the pushback against regulation, uh, and uh, we will return to that, uh, and I'm sure that Adam is going to have thoughts uh, in a while, is that it creates some impediments in the sense that there are rules, and rules always come at a cost. On the other hand, there are some expected either benefits or upsides that you're trying to pit against as you are devising rules because presumably you're not in the business of creating a bureaucracy for rules' sake. Can you help us understand when you look at this trade-off, when you think about, okay, yes, this convenience and this customer centricity is great, but we still want to create something that is going to keep things in check so that we don't have too much power. What are the things that you're trying to protect? What are the upsides uh, that you're going to be focusing on? Well, uh, I wouldn't say that in a negative way. I would say in a positive way, we want to ensure that, again, we have the control of our data. Citizens understand how systems work, and the systems can also serve uh, citizens. And the citizens are conscious of how the business models work. So this is something that we keep in mind when we uh, proceed with regulation. Uh, so um, we, what we also want is to ensure that these ecosystems, because it's a uh, it's not, it's, it shouldn't be a war, it should be also a collaboration, at least with like-minded uh, uh, countries. Um, to achieve that, we need to have a clear a certainty, a specific framework that we didn't have. So we need to set the framework and the priorities and um, to ensure that we can protect our democracy because when you have a Cambridge Analytica case where targeted advertisement can change your perception, because your newsfeed is focused specifically on negative content or harmful content, then this is something that needs, on our behalf, on our side, on our, on our understanding, um, to be controlled that it doesn't you know, um, create uh, misperceptions. So I think this is, uh, this is the, um, the mission that we see ahead of us. In the same time, we, we understand that this is a global competition on that, it's more easy to, uh, let's say, have unicorns in China. But do we have the same mentality uh, for, ch for privacy as China? I don't think we have. Uh, what I definitely can say is that now, since the digital ecosystems are empowering identities, we are moving into the metaverse. So we're going to have to have a discussion on digital identities, which we haven't had yet. And uh, I already saw that there was like a, a bullying case on the, on the metaverse. And they said, oh, we have to have some rules in the metaverse. So this is when action needs to take place, when you understand that things are developing so fast and uh, regulation has to follow innovation in a smart way, in a friendly way, uh, but still you need to have it in order to uh, ensure that citizens will use the applications and they will feel safe there. I heard a friend, he has basically uh, a gaming application 
which is part of the metaverse, and his daughter is asking for money to buy clothes online, digital clothes, not physical, not to order to get them at home, but for her avatar. So this is happening, and then children don't feel very happy if they don't have access to this kind of clothes, and then you might need a stylist there, you might need to have politicians in the metaverse. So things are happening in a way that maybe we don't like it. I, I, I'm not sure I, I would like to have an online identity, but um, we also didn't expect that AI would come so fast in our lives or teleworking. And now I haven't seen the Delphi form in a physical manner for like almost three years, I think. And, and physical is nice, but we have to ensure that we, um, we will play a role into the um, online chaos before it's, it's too late. Again, because we don't have just like-minded partners. We have China, for example, but they have a different perception of privacy. They control data. The government controls it. They know exactly where you are. They can revoke your access to services. They can direct advertisement to you. I think we need definitely to, to be aligned into what kind of internet we want. So, Eva, what I hear you say is that uh, we need to think about what are the rules that we set for ecosystems that relate to data, and there is a data and privacy component. There is a competition, and competition in terms of both vis-a-vis -vis the complementers and vis-a-vis -vis the final consumers, so that we think that there is fairness. There may be some broader societal issues that come up. So the uh, brave new world of ecosystems creates new regulatory challenges and opens questions which before were dormant. We didn't even need to bother thinking about them. Exactly, but what you're mentioning now is, is all of those uh, words are pieces of our legislation, that they are completing this puzzle of the digital uh, economy files, and we are adding the Data Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act, how much face recognition do we want, biometric surveillance, is it acceptable in the public spaces or not? Uh, what could be harmful, how we can protect citizens before it's too late. And now we're going to have also um, uh, some files on the semiconductors, for example, strategic autonomy. It means if we need cutting-edge technology for our devices in order to work and we are scared about like disruption of supply chains, we need to act now because to achieve to have any kind of autonomy, even just to be part of this complex uh, global system, we need from one to seven years to achieve Absolutely. that, to double our production. 10% we have in Europe, yeah. and 10% is US, yep. just 10. And we need to double it, and it would take seven years. So, Francois, um, I'm tempted, given that we've sort of both worked together on both AI and now on uh, some of these metaverse issues, to ask you to give us a bit of a sense of what is happening and what are the differences in terms of uh, these ecosystems. We already have seen different AI ecosystems, for the reasons that Eva is mentioning, operating with different rules in China, in the US, and the EU. Uh, and now we're seeing the emerging, the looming battle to form the ecosystems of metaverse, although we're in early stages. So can you give us a bit of a sense, at no, least I of the I think that AI one? and metaverse in three minutes, I, I think that's fine. <laughs> so, um, but... Uh, <laughs> so, um, I think that I, I've been studying uh, ecosystems in different regions of the world, and I think that the most inspiring on AI related is probably in... Uh, in China. Um, and what I have seen with the emergence of industry specific, but industry in the broad sense, um, AI ecosystems. Uh, the, the, the government uh, was initiating it. Uh, in 2017, they asked uh, tech giants, so Alibaba, to go into smart cities, uh, Tencent to go on image recognition in um, uh, healthcare, Baidu for autonomous driving. But really, as the orchestrators of some other ecosystem, of, of let's say specific ecosystems, and then what we see that we have some companies that I call transformers that both master the technology and master the uh, and know the the vertical industry quite well, and they will then adapt the tools that are uh, given by the orchestrator, the libraries, and so on, to the specificities of the industry. They provide um, data sciences and so on. And, and by doing that, they are making the transformation and the AI transformation for the traditional companies much simpler. And based on that, you have a vertical or an industry-specific AI ecosystem. And the result is the following. 
the adoption of AI in traditional company of AI in traditional companies in China is, according to a study that we, I, I did with MIT, twice as high in China compared to Europe or the US. And I think it's something that might be important for Europe to play. Um, because these so-called transformers in Europe, we have them. But they are very small. And as they are just startups, the traditional companies do not believe, do not trust them to embark their transformation. So what is missing are the orchestrators. And this is why I believe that governments could play a role not just in terms of regulation or in terms of uh, uh, subsidies, but really in terms of being an architect of this, or at least a catalyst, by being a trusted third party, for instance, in data sharing exchange platforms. And, and I think that for the development of Europe, if we want to be, uh, let's say, at a, uh, a new stage of development, no doubt it's a good opportunity. Then on metaverse, maybe just one word, I don't know, what is for sure is that we, there will need, we will need hardware, we will need uh, platforms, we will need content, and at the moment, each of the players are just trying to put their narratives to become the orchestrator. So will it be Apple, Meta, Google, uh, Gucci, or, uh, or Netflix? I don't know. But at the moment, they're all competing into it. So it's more a competition of narratives than a competition of uh, building it. Which is part of the fun way of saying that customer centricity cuts a number of different ways. Because of course different people can try to compete with what does the customer want and create something around it. But uh, the, the, other compo the other part that you mentioned that I wanted to stress is the fact that ecosystems suggest that there is an, a new perhaps augmented role for thoughtful policy that can support it because whether we like it or not, we are in a geopolitical yeah. game with three main pillars, US, EU, and China. Certainly we have seen as a, and, on and the base of the war and, and we how not, that enhances. And we should not forget the global south and Africa because if we are not making them successful, if we make them just laggards, mm. then it will be a massive problem for us. Absolutely. So our future might be in Africa. And very quickly in the time that we've got, one of the things that we heard is the Sorry. need to uh, think about how we can create some upside and the importance of the rules. Part of the rules are the rules that have been exposed externally. But what is it that you guys in Google say, hang on a minute, we can create some templates for the governance of ecosystem that can be a complement to uh, good regulation to address some of these problems that we hear? Absolutely. I think you know, giving consumers the ability to choose the products and services that they're using, making sure that you never lock them into your ecosystem. Uh, Google, you know, long before the Digital Markets Act, has been working on data portability and making it possible for you, if you're a Google user, to export your contacts, to export your emails to a rival service. And that kind of mobility, you, you referred to it as modularity, Francois, I, you know, that, that in, enables choice. It facilitates competition. And we, we strongly agree with a framework that will make that possible for, for consumers, that will give citizens the confidence that that works. Interoperability is another, it's a big tech term, but how do you make sure that these services work with each other so that consumers don't face lock into a particular ecosystem, that they can pick and choose if they're a business uh, or, or a customer, an individual customer, they can pick and choose the services that they think will suit them best. Terrific, and as we think about the new rules that will govern the way that we're organized and society as a result of this shift to ecosystem-based uh, competition needs to think about them, we also need to think about how it is that we're going to be first keeping with what each society wants. And um, as Eva alluded to a moment ago, uh, there is a very different level of acceptance of the use of data in China than there is in Europe. Here we have long scars that have happened in uh, leading up to the Second World War and governments potentially abusing information. Whereas in China, they welcome the use of information because they think it increases social cohesion. Now, despite that, we are in a geopolitical fight for core technologies such as AI. So when you think about them as the final word, you know, how do you strike the balance? That's for me. Yeah. I have a Nobel if I answer that, okay? <laughs> I get the Nobel. So, um, so first you have to understand what your priorities need to be 
and they have to be coherent with your values and principles. So for Europe, even if the numbers of the unicorns are not numbers that make us happy, at least we know we're leading with quality. And this is something we need to achieve in several ways. And again, we, we want to respect privacy, we want to have citizens that they feel that AI is complementary to them, is not replacing them, and people are at the center. I'm not sure it's the same in China. So I, I have met several people that they actually want to succeed in US or China and come back and live in, in Europe. <laughs> and I think this says everything. And the way uh, I believe that it will end up, this AI act, uh, because everybody is concerned about like overregulation, we're going to ban the uses of AI that can be harmful. We're going to have a, a risk pyramid. So the high risk, they will be changing, of course, uh, AI applications that can be harmful. But the majority of applications, they don't belong there. They're just like simple applications that we use every day. They don't, they're not harmful. They can use AI systems and they're usually like for internal operational reasons. Um, uh, they need to have a lot of data that we, we constantly uh, generate. But the value is going to increase constantly, and we need to ensure that citizens will uh, harness the benefits of, of this technology. Terrific. Lots of us to think about and work on, but in half an hour, how could we ask for a better brief coverage? Thank you very much to our fellow family. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.